Welcome to Building Healthy Relationships, the Four Habits podcast, helping you enjoy better harmony at home, thrive at work, and win at life. Here are your hosts, Dr. Andrea and John Taylor Cummings, recognized authorities on the subjects of improving work relationships and cultures, as well as couple and home relationships. Well, welcome back, friends. Today, we will be discussing a topic that needs no introduction, Mm -hmm. conflict. We've all experienced it and we've all developed our own ways of handling it. But the question that we want to discuss today is this. Is your response helping or hindering? Um, Absolutely. And what a great question to ask, because unless you've had some training Mm -hmm. or you have naturally been gifted in this area, and some people are, but not very many as far as we people we've come across. Some people do are, are naturally gifted in this area. But apart from that, unless you've had some sort of training in this area, your responses are more than likely hindering rather than helping your response. Absolutely. So, Andrew, why don't you kick us off on that? Why, why is this? Why is that the case so often? Well, I guess when tensions run high, when emotions are running mm-hmm. high... Most of us don't have the skills to turn up as our best selves. We don't have the skills to relate well to each other under pressure. Mm. And that shows up in different ways. You know, for some people, they might get louder. They might shout. They might use tactics like belittling Mm -hmm. other people, even shouting or swearing. Um, Other people might go in the opposite direction. They might get quieter. They might withdraw. They might use the silent treatment or they might use, you know, microaggressions or kind of underhanded ways Mm -hmm. of dealing with the conflict. Either way, what we end up doing is creating distance in relationships and hurting each other emotionally and sometimes physically as well. Not really equipped to do conflict well when, when emotions are running high. And I guess what we want to talk about today is the way that psychologists describe the way that we treat conflict. And they talk about four typical ways that we each turn up in a conflict situation, none of which, by the way, spoiler alert, none of which is <laughs> of particularly help helpful. Nope. But um, do you want to kick off, John, by telling us some more of that? Absolutely. So last time, I think it was the last episode we did, we looked at some of the personality types. And why I, I mentioned those because the personality types tend to link very strongly and very closely with the way we show up in conflict. Um, and psychologists have shown that there are really four distinct ways in which people tend to show up in conflict. Um, and actually, as we spoke, showed, shared the last time, four personality types, and each of those links very relates directly, relates very directly to, strong correlation with yeah, one of these conflict styles. With, with, with these types. Um, the, we, we shared a animal personality model. You may recall if you've listened to that episode, but for the benefit of those who didn't, just very quickly. Um, there are four animals that, or stereotypical animals that behave in a certain way, and those animals come from four quadrants when you put together two different dimensions. And one dimension is how, is people's tendencies, how do we tend to, um, or, or some people tend to um, like to, to lead, and others are more likely to, or happy to let other people lead on one dimension. And on the second dimension, some people are very much task-focused, focused on the job, whereas other people are much more people-focused. When you put those two dimensions together, you get different quadrants. Mm. And in the top, and and in each of those quadrants, there is a animal personality type we spoke about again in that last episode. And the key point of the animal is that the the strength of that animal Mm. is intuitively reflecting the strength of that particular personality. And and you'll see see what we mean as as we go here. So in the top left quadrant where you have the people who love to lead, and the people who are very much focused on the task, we call those the lions. Now, what do you think a lion does in a conflict situation? So you put it like that, you kind of get it like, ah, oh, okay. So lions generally want to win. They want to dominate. They want to take over things. They want to roar. Yeah. And so what the psychologists have shown is in a lot of um, in conflict situations, there is a certain personality type, the lions. What they want to do in a conflict situation is to win. Yeah. They roar. They want to dominate. Um quite often they have the strong sense that their way is the right way and they want to impose that and just get on with this job and move on to the next one. And to be fair (laughs) to them, quite often they are right Mm -hmm. because they have this gift. That's their strength, isn't it? Task focused, goal oriented. Mm -hmm. They know what to do. They get on with it. They they eat challenge for breakfast. But sadly, some of that strength 
turns up in the way that they do conflict and can crush relationships if they're not self-aware. Absolutely. Now, this one was a big, big challenge for us. Yeah. Because for us personally, because both of us have lion in us. Yeah. We have a lot of lion in us. We roar. That means we roar <laughs> and both of us want our way. And so, yeah, there are any number of examples we could share with you on how this has been a challenge for us, an ongoing challenge. But still, to this day, yeah. to, to some degree, still a challenge. Now, now I think we... We've learned how to recognize what we're doing. Well, what, what I say to people is we still argue, but we've learned how to argue better mm-hmm. and how to keep the relationship safe and, and, and uh, strong and in the process. Faster. Exactly. Yeah, recover- exactly. And the recovery is the important thing when it comes on to conflict. Yeah. So I guess a quicker side point to make is uh, people panic whenever there is conflict in a relationship and think there's something desperately mm-hmm. wrong. But the fact that you are having conflict shows that you're two individuals with different thinking minds, and that's great. But to do conflict well, uh, we have to develop the skills because it's going to happen. So don't don't fear it. Get better at it. And the recovery from it mm. is a really important thing to, to be good at. I'm trying to think. I was going to think of one example to share of us being lions and, and, and getting through it. And I think one, if there's one example I'd share is, um, as I said, there are any number of examples we could share. But even when we wrote the book together, yeah, that, that was an example, a great example there because... We, we sat down and we spoke about it, um, you know, clearly had the ideas and let's, how do we put them the down together? basic structure, yeah. And mm-hmm. then Andrea had the, the go at writing the first draft and putting things together. And I looked at it, hmm, not a whole lot of structure, not, not as much structure as I would like to have had here. So I put some structure around it, got my little red pen out and put some structure there and some points and then passed it back to her. And she said, hmm, okay, but, you know, red pen, or what? red pen, red typing, whatever, you know, using using track changes on Word. Yeah, I don't like when you red pen my work. The red, red instead comes of out telling a me lot. how brilliant it is. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that was each of us trying to get our own way, to some degree, of having a strong view on what we thought was the right way to do it mm. and trying to uh, impose our view, I guess, is... is Call it what it is. That, that's what you're trying to do. I think it's fair to say as part of the self-defense, self-protection mechanism, mm. uh, our, our own egos and our insecurities get in the way whenever yeah. there is conflict. And that's what causes us to really not turn up well because we're only in there looking out for our own interest. And you can just imagine, <laughs> you don't have to imagine, you probably know exactly what it's like when you have two people turning up with, uh, the intention to look out for their own needs, mm. you know, that doesn't work well for resolving conflict or for the relationship. And this isn't just about lions being lions, even though lions can do it particularly well. Mm. Everybody goes into a conflict situation looking out for their own interest until they become more self-aware yeah. and I, develop the skills. I was going to just go back to that example for a second. What what I think is fair to say is we both recognize, though, that through it... Mm. Um, through that pain of having to experience and witness and feel the pain of red pen on my work. My work my work was perfect. I thought it was perfect. But through that process of backwards and forwards and red penning each other's work, essentially, we knew that we would get to a better result at the end. The end result would be the best that either of us could have done or better than either of us could have done independently. Well, that's been the learning through this whole journey of yeah. becoming a better team together, whether it's in the home context or the work context. It's just knowing that the end result, it, it, figuring out how to go through the sometimes very scratchy bits of working together. Mm. We know that if we stick to it and apply the principles that we're teaching, we will get to a result that's better than either of us would have produced on our own. Yeah, uh, we, we know that's the goal. We know that that's where we'll end up. We just need to figure out how to get there. Absolutely. So that was a bit of us sharing our lion personality yeah, and we, how we uh, respond in conflict. More, more confession time, I think. What about the otter? How does the otter respond in uh, in conflict? And actually, for the benefit of our listeners, why don't you just show them, tell them a little bit about what the otter, um, you know, where that sits on the on the dimensions on the matrix. So talking about the dimensions, the otter is very much uh, happy to lead or mm-hmm. wanting to lead. Mm-hmm. Uh, but very alert to people and their emotions. So very tuned in to what's going on on the people side, which is why they're the ones who can be very creative, kind of the inspiring leaders because they can Mm -hmm. bring people along. And I have been told, I think we're (laughs) going to end up talking a lot more uh, off on side (laughs) stories than maybe we plan to, but I have been told that in conflict situations, I talk and talk and talk a lot. Really? (laughs) Oh my goodness. Now, in my head, that's about 
talking until I feel like I am heard. You know, I think the a big thing for me is to feel like I'm heard and understood that my viewpoint has been taken into consideration. I think if I'm honest with myself or, or myself, <laughs> how many yeah, of you are there? Like, oh, I mean, each, one of, <laughs> each one of those is having a conversation. That's what it is. If I am <laughs> honest with myself, um, what's really happening or what's really going on in my head is I think my way is the right way and mm. that if people understood it like I understand it, that they'll agree with me. So if they're not agreeing with me, it means they don't understand it. So I need to explain it some more. So that's how I'll end up, you know, confession time, talking and talking, because it, it's like you're not getting it. Let me tell you another way. Let me tell you another way. So it's probably a combo <laughs> of the lion and the otter coming through together. Yeah, there. yeah. I'm going to inspire you to believe like I believe, mm-hmm, and then mm-hmm. you'll come along with me. But, you know, the lion in me wants to win. And I remember the, the one situation that sticks out in my head a lot is mm. some years ago, we were all sat together. So you, me, my two sisters, their husbands. I can't remember what we were talking about, but I do remember that you all weren't agreeing with me. That And, and I was getting frustrated and we kind of ended the conversation with me feeling like oh, almost attacked because mm. nobody was agreeing with me. And I remember my brother-in-law, Sean, who is always the patient, wise mm. one. He would ju- He just came to me when I was off somewhere in a half and he said, sis, it's not that we don't understand you. We understand exactly what we're, what you're saying. We just don't agree with you. Mm. And that was like, wow. Like I heard for the first time that people could actually understand and still not agree with me and that I had to give them space to not agree. So that, you know, that sticks out in my memory. And even if you if you know, explained it from 50 different ways, they, they still they have still, a different they got, it. they got it. They got it, but they still didn't agree. So I yeah. suppose a great line for an otter is to say, I've heard you and I got it, yeah. but I don't agree. Mm-hmm. And there's a proverb that says, when there's a lot of talk, the more mm-hmm. talk there mm-hmm. is, the less truth there is. And I had to learn that for me, that if I find myself talking a lot, that I'm moving from just sharing truth into getting very selfish yeah. and, and going after what I want. So... Mm-hmm. Yeah, big learning, still learning it. Um, still prefer when people go along with what I say because I think my <laughs> head is a great but that's, uh, that's the learning of how to do conflict better as an otter. So we've done lion, we've done otter. What about the beaver? Your my turn time. now. My turn. Your my confession time. time. All right then. So beavers. So beavers are, again, for the benefit of those listening to this, for the personalities for the first time. So beavers are very much focused on detail. Um, but they're also, um, oh, sorry, on the task, I should say, the task yeah. at hand, uh, but they're happy to let other people lead. Um, and, and again, just to point out, it's not that they can't lead, because uh, yeah, they can absolutely lead. But they're it's just, not it's not the be-all to end-all for them. They don't need to be in the they limelight. They don't need to be in the limelight. If somebody else wants to lead, let them lead. If I need to lead, I can lead, but rest of the time, crack on. But that combination, that quadrant of uh, focused on the task and happy to let other people lead, mean that beavers are very much quality conscious attention to detail get everything right yeah and in a conflict situation if they don't have all the facts or all the information they don't know the right way to handle it um they think somebody else might have a better way of handling it whatever they can just give in and let the other person have it Mm -hmm. and that might look like for an easy life it's not always that it's more just a case of you know what i don't know how to handle this thing so fine i'll just i'll just let you have this one Mm -hmm. um and that is it, it seems on the surface that, that that's okay, but if you do that too many times and you're giving in and you're giving in and you're giving in, it gets to the point sometimes where you're just done giving in, especially yeah. if you're up against a, a lion otter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, talk you to death. Talk, talk you into a corner, talk you to death. Exhaust you. <laughs> exhaust you. Um, you. You will give it up to a point. And there's, again, a number of examples we could share of where that's played out in our, in our relationship and our lives. And just one we had, even just even the other day. So this is to show you that these things can still happen. You have to realize what's going on, and then ah, oh, this is what's going on here. This is this is why we are where we are. Okay, now we know where we're going. On, what's going on? We can address it. And it was to do. It, sometimes it can be the most simple, the most ridiculous things that you end up falling out over. It, it often is, isn't it? But it's the underlying ego or insecurities yeah. that fuel the emotions to rise. Yeah. yeah. So the example I was going to share was napkins. Okay. Napkins. <laughs> Can you believe that? We fell out over napkins. And in fact, the size of napkins. We're in the supermarket looking to pick up some napkins. We run out of napkins at home. And paper napkins. 
And I said, why don't we get this size? And Andrew goes, no, no, I like to get the bigger size. I'm, but we just bought a holder for them, and the big ones flop over in this thing, and they don't, it doesn't, doesn't look right. We should get the small napkins because they sit nice and neatly in this holder. It looks nice on the counter. Why don't we get the small ones? Oh, but I prefer the large ones. Because, 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 go on, go on. because they cover better and uh, protect my clothes from getting food all over them. So. <laughs> but at that point, I'm done just giving in on anything now. It's like, okay, I want the small napkins. You can see how ridiculous this is now. And when we stop and think about it, we laugh. But, you know, it's little things like that where you've got, I probably, I clearly I've just gotten to the point of, you know what, this is just another thing I'm having to give in on. I, I just want my napkins. Can I have my napkins, please? You'll stop behaving like a baby almost. Yeah. And so, so I hope the listeners will be assured that, you know, one, nobody's perfect. We're still on a mm-hmm. learning journey. Mm-hmm. So we're mm-hmm. not coming at this mm-hmm. from having ticked all the boxes and known it. But two, there is a way forward. You know, yeah. once you understand what's going on, you can really dig deeper and find the better person in you to uh, uh, address conflict in a way that's healthier yeah. for the relationship and not argue over napkins over the side of Exactly. Well, it's good when you can get to the point of laughing at it and yeah. recognizing what's going on and, and actually laugh about it. Okay, so that's, um, pardon me, three of the ways of handling conflict. What's yeah. the fourth one? Uh, well, so we're talking about the golden retrievers now. Mm-hmm. And golden retrievers, as we said before, it's not about just any old dog. It's the nature of the golden retriever that reflects the strength of this personality mm-hmm, really mm-hmm, well mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so golden retrievers are happy to let others lead they don't need to be in the limelight very very focused on people and their emotions mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so these are our nurturers these are the ones who yeah. naturally know how to build great relationships these are the ones who are the caregivers mm-hmm. they're the teachers they cause us to do right by people to operate with integrity where, where, where people are concerned um in a conflict situation, because they're wired to build great relationships, conflict is really to- against everything that they naturally um, sense and feel and want to do in relationships. That is just a very uncomfortable situation for them because harmony is, is what they thrive on. So the tendency in a conflict situation is to withdraw themselves. They become overwhelmed very easily with conflict, definitely with shouting or overpowering behavior they'll absolutely need to retreat find a safe safe space and that's not to say that they are abandoning the relationship or they're you know going to break off all ties they just need to find that quiet space to regroup process what's going on and then come back to talk things through when tempers have calmed down a bit uh so um we we Think of a couple of examples straight away. Now, the, the, we're not retrievers. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> we're not retrievers, but we're related to people who are retrievers, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. we work with people who are retrievers. And we've had to learn as uh, lions and otters and beavers to be softer and more gentle, and to create a safer space when you're dealing with retrievers, so that you can really hear what's bothering them because they care so much about the other person. They might not even talk about what it is that they need. Mm. So they really aren't wired to do conflict well at all. It's a skill to learn. And one of the things that uh, retrievers would need to get better at is saying no or drawing the line, the boundaries in behaviors to say, okay, we can talk about this, but not like Mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Uh, When you've calmed down, when we'll have a better conversation. Uh, And the other thing we've noticed with retrievers is sometimes they take the high road in the way they respond Mm -hmm. so in their head they believe (laughs) that not arguing not engaging in conflict and withdrawing and calming down is the more uh, emotionally intelligent or the more superior way to deal with conflict but it's it's still one of the selfish ways of dealing with it because you're not actually dealing with it you're abandoning the person or the thing that needs to be wrestled through uh, and notice I said wrestle through, not mm-hmm. the person to be wrestled yeah. with. <laughs> no, uh, no, but no. you're abandoning the conversation to find your own safety, mm. regardless of how that lands with the person. So whichever personality style you are, the point is we all have blind sides and bad habits in conflict that we need to get better at so that we can come up with a solution that's really win-win yeah. and keep the environment safe uh, and healthy so that you focus on the issue and attack the issues up from the same side rather than attacking each other yeah. in one either overtly in more 
obvious, harsh, aggressive tones or more subversively in, you know, yeah. withdrawal or microaggressions or silent treatment and so on. So the point is we need to we need to focus on how we are responding rather than how we're just reacting because our reactions is, is the point we're trying to make here are just not helpful. Yeah. And there's a big difference between responding and reacting. And responses is a controlled um measured a controlled response. measured yeah. um reaction. I'm trying to, I'm trying to find a better word for using than that. But it, it's it's our controlled uh, measured way of coming back rather yeah. than just reacting with our default. It's the behavior that we choose in the moment yeah. uh, is the response, yeah. Yeah, yeah there's, there's a lovely way that uh, Viktor Frankl puts it. So Viktor Frankl is the psychologist who, um, or psychotherapist, who, who, who survived the Holocaust, the, the Holocaust yeah. and the concentration camps and so on. But he said between uh, stimulus and response, there is a space. Mm. And in that space, we have the power to choose our response. And in that response is our growth and our freedom. Wow. Go, wow. It's, That's it's so such, powerful. Such a, such a powerful, um, quote, a message there. In that space, we have the power to choose our response. Yeah. So choose and choose wisely. Um, and that really is what it comes down to. Now, we, we unpack a lot more about this in our in the book, mm -hmm. in the um, accelerator course that we have out there now as well to help people go deeper. Um, but it really comes down to thinking about how can you control your default response? And there are a number of things that you need to do to be able to do that. But it, it does take some time to think about it. And one of the things that I've certainly found really helpful is thinking about, firstly, the person you'd like to be, the person you want to be, you'll be proud of, to say, okay, yeah, I responded like that. I'm proud because quite often we respond in a conflict situation in a way that leaves us feeling, oh my goodness, did I say that? Did I do that? Is that really how I came across? Yeah, wish I did it differently, which is... Wish I did it differently. Victor Frankl's point about in the responses, our growth. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And one of the things I've certainly found helpful for me was actually thinking big picture. What do I mean by that? So we had the benefit. We It took us years to have our first child, or seven years. We, yeah. we had to wait to have our first child. So <clears throat> if, if there was any silver lining to that cloud... What it did is it allowed us to observe and learn from our peer groups, so all our friends and, you know, com um, so what I'm looking for, contemporaries, uh, went ahead. They had children. They're like 10 years ahead of us and oh, everything. Like 10, maybe, yeah, yeah. Well, a few, yeah, exactly. Seven, seven, between seven and 10 years yeah. ahead of us. Um, and so we're able to observe how they did things and learn from them and think, oh, we'll do some of that. We won't do some of that, etc. cetera. So yeah. one of the benefits, I guess. And... One of the things that really struck me was observing the relationship that they had with, with their children. I'm talking about a whole raft of people out there, not picking on anybody in particular. But actually, we realized that some had strong relationships with their children and others didn't. So for me, it was a bit of a light bulb moment to think, these things just don't happen on their automatically, own. Automatically, <laughs> It's not automatic. If you want a strong relationship with your child, you've got to invest in it. And I remember hearing a story, somebody sharing about how uh, they made it their life's mission to be uh, to to invest in the relationship with their children, such that when their children left home, they wouldn't um, they would want to come back home. Yeah. Not just for handouts or for you know out of some sort of feeling of pity to come and look up look up look or, up or mom and dad or obligation duty. or anything yeah. or duty. No, 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 they didn't want that. They wanted them to want to come home out of joy. It's like, hey, mom, dad, I'm here to see you. I just love spending time with you. That's what I wanted. That's what I want. Uh, how do I invest in, in children, in, in our children? And I, and I remember feeling uh, that oh, it was getting to the point as the teenage years approached, mm -hmm. or we got into the teenage years with uh, our... Locking horns. Certainly with our eldest, who is a lion. A lot of lion in there. And so lion to lion, we've had that conversation, lion to lion, they kind of lock horns. I think the older she horns, gets, but you know what? <laughs> the older she gets, the more we realize she's very much like daddy. Mm -hmm. And... <laughs> And so some things come out, and I guess with teenagers they're going through hormonal changes and all sorts of things, um, some things come out not necessarily right. And for me, respect or disrespect has always been a big uh, trigger, is perhaps not the right word, but it just gets me. I, I, dis I do not like disrespect or what I perceive as disrespect. And so she would say things sometimes and I'd respond and we'd end up almost in a situation where every conversation was, was a tense battle, or a battle yeah. or it was, it was just, it just wasn't pleasant. And I realized, actually, hang on, if every situation or every conversation is like this, 
her memory is not going to be of this. This is not a fun place to be. Yeah. So when when eventually she leaves home and you know after university or whatever, why is she going to want to come back for more of this? Yeah. So I'm like, ah, oh, okay, hang on. <laughs> I need to change this. I need to do something different. Yeah. And invest in us having a different kind of relationship so that it's fun and she has fun, fun, fond memories and wants to come back. So I had to start choosing my battles. Now, of course, there's still some things that would get me and I would still have some tense conversations, but it wasn't every conversation. And I think that's part of the... I mean, we have a great relationship today. Yeah. It can always be better. There's always room growth for, for improvement. But I think she might want to come, continue to keep coming back home. Yeah, she came back after university. Came back after that's university. A that's start. a good first sign. Came back, moved back in. So Yeah, but I think that was a real light bulb moment in the family yeah. dynamics as well mm-hmm. so that we became mm-hmm. a lot more intentional about the memory of the experience from, you, you know, what's the net balance in the ex- interactions for today? Did we end up having that warm feeling or does everybody feel tense and frustrated? And learning to manage, you know, in another episode of podcast, we've spoken about the emotional bank account, mm-hmm. just learning to manage the net balance in that emotional bank account to make sure that the, the, the lasting memory of the experience is one of warmth and fun and engagement and just wanting to be around each other that's what we keep trying to manage and the way we do conflict is an important part of of maintaining the balance yeah yeah so how do we wrap this one up in conflict so well but i think a maya angelo quote is Mm. very relevant here because maya angelo said uh you won't necessarily people won't remember what you did Mm -hmm. they might not remember what you said but they will absolutely remember how you made 100%. them feel. <laughs> and especially if it's a bad feeling. Well, good or bad, but if it's a bad feeling, they will never forget that one. Well, that's the thing. You know, the way we do conflict will leave a huge emotional footprint, mm. uh, for want of a better word. And and, and that's for the better or for the worse. That's a great word. A yeah. huge emotional footprint. A huge emotional yeah. footprint. So if we do it well, it will be a great memory. It will mm. be a great emotional footprint. If we do it badly it will be a painful one. And the more painful ones there are, the less people want to engage with mm. you at all. So learning how to do conflict well is vital for building strong relationships. Otherwise, we'll wreck it without even thinking about it, just turning up and doing the, the selfish thing, which is our default wiring, is to go in for our own ego, our insecurities, whatever our needs are. That's what we go... To, to, to battle to get without thought of how it's landing with the other person or how it's impacting the relationship. So that brings us right back to the question that we started with, isn't it? In conflict situations, mm-hmm. are your responses helping you or hindering you? Are they Something strengthening or damaging mm-hmm. the relationship? You know, do you naturally go into mm-hmm. to a win-win mode where everybody comes out well, the relationship comes out stronger and the result that you have is win-win for the relationship. Or do you still go into battle, so to speak, oh. with a selfish mode where actually nobody wins? So, oh, well, if it's win-lose, you might win, but the relationship mm-hmm. would lose mm-hmm. because nobody and nobody likes to be losing all the time. So your partner or the other person on the other side would be left with this negative emotional footprint. So the question is, are your responses helping or hindering? Uh, And if they're hindering, are you ready to find out how to do conflict better? That's what this is about here. And if you want to, there's some resources that we have. Do you want to share? Absolutely. Well, there's a book. There's the online course. You can find out more at the4habits.com. The number of resources on there. We'd, We'd love to hear from you. We hope this session has really been helpful. We hope we've challenged you a little bit. Oh, we've because... certainly shared all our uh, <laughs> yep, <laughs> our yep. stories. Yeah, hope you hope you've had a good laugh as well. But hopefully, some of the things have resonated. You thought, oh yeah, actually, yeah, we do that as well, or they do that as well. I do this, they do that. Um, we we want through this entire series. It's, we've said intentionality is the word. We want people to be intentional about re- improving, as removing, improving their relationships. We want people to be on purpose about learning, recognizing what they're doing, and saying, okay, how can I call myself higher how can i do things better here yeah improve myself so we'd love to you know share resources with you as i say check out the website the fourhabits.com we'd love to hear from you if you have questions send us your questions you can send yeah. them to hello at the fourhabits.com um if there's space on the podcast that you're on whether it's youtube or spotify or google or apple or wherever maybe you can leave some comments in there it may take us a while to get to them but hopefully in time we'll get to them and we'll respond 
but the more direct route, send us send us an email, hello at thefourhabits.com. We'd love to hear from you. And let's all keep on this journey of just getting better in relationships, being intentional, and enjoying the relationships with the people around us, whether it's at home or at work or just generally in life. Let's do relationships better. Yeah, let's do relationships better. That's a great note to end it on. So I think from us, we're going to say that's a wrap. That's a wrap. Bye-bye for now and see you next time. We hope you enjoyed that episode. And if you did and you want to hear more, the best thing to do is subscribe. Then you'll never miss an episode. There's a new one every Friday. You can stay connected with us on social media at The Four Habits for updates, behind the scenes content, and to participate in discussions related to the show. We always love to hear from you. And of course, if you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review on your preferred platform to allow us to reach more listeners and help people around the globe radically transform the way they do relationships so they too can enjoy better harmony at home, thrive at work, and win at life.